Welcome to you all. We have um, we have um, a good range of speakers today, which unfortunately means they've got very little time to speak. So I'm busy mulling over how we make good the deficit by using the workshops that I am a bit better. Because you, when once you see what we've got here today, you're going to want to know more. I'm sure you are. But I'll pick off, even though people are still joining us, because the time is short. So Mary's slide. Um, the technologies. Um, uh, we look at new technologies for trust to consider. We are particularly looking at trusts that don't have a route, easy route to net zero. So we have um, half the call is, is devoted to um, the ability to take natural gas and clean, turn it into clean hydrogen on site, which is something that sites that have gas, but not hydrogen or geothermal or anything else like that can use to clean their sites up. Then for sites that have to go the air source heat pump or the heat pump route, uh, then we the next three calls try and deal with the cost of electricity and how we deal with that, because you guys have all got revenue problems if that's the way you go to net zero. So we've we've already covered in the first set of talks geothermal, hydrogen, and green district energy, which are direct routes to net zero. We've now got decarbonization of gas, which is which is a pretty close run next thing. And then we've got other methods of getting towards net zero um, to the largely deal with the electricity that comes with heat pumps. So, so we'll get on with that. Mm. Now, um, all the 209 biggest emitters in the NHS are part of this program. So you're welcome to be on board. You're welcome to use the NH power as, um, resources as, as such as they exist and, and get as much help as we can give you. Today, we're focusing largely on the trusts that are the, the, the uh, blue circles. So the ones of the blue circles are the ones that, that we don't think have a direct route to net zero, i.e. Uh, geothermal, um, um, okay. hydrogen being piped to them any, any time particularly soon, or uh, a DE scheme that will be green. But we don't know all the DE schemes and we don't know all your business, so we might not have it exactly right. But the, the, the you people have received a special invite to today. <coughs> you, you know you're one of those sites by the nature of your invite. Um, okay. So um, the we first talk speaker we'll have is uh, Suizo, one of the decarbonisation. Uh, I think we have a decision items. on whether yeah. we're uh, working to April or August. So, so we could, I um, we could, could can we mute whoever's um, talk we can hear? And can we hand over to to Suizo first? Good. Uh, Clive, I assume you're going to flick the slides oh. here. I am. Just say next slide, please. OK, well, next slide would be good. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Well, good afternoon, I should say. Um, pleasure to have a chance to speak to you all. Uh, I'm starting this off, so I'm going to spend a bit of time just talking through what uh, methane parole Have we lost somebody? Steers on me. Yeah, yeah steers on me. Mute. Okay, mute us. Uh, can you, can you? How's that? 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 Sorry about that. Uh, basically, as I've, um, I said, good afternoon. Pleasure to meet you all. Uh, we've got a short amount of time, which I'm, I'm going to rattle through here. Obviously, if you've got any, any questions that we uh, on the material we cover, by all means, put in the, uh, the chat and I'll answer them as quick, quickly and best I can. So what is methane pyrolysis and why is it relevant for you, for you all? Well, first of all, it's one of the three ways to make uh, hydrogen. You can either use the methane reformation, electrolysis or methane pyrolysis. Methane pyrolysis, as you would probably expect me to say, is the best way to do it. Uh, it can be done on site. Uh, it effectively decarbonizes the natural gas, which you're all using right now, and massively reduces your carbon footprint. Uh, it also has a low impact in terms of electrical energy requirement by, by comparison to things like electrolysis. And also it has a very small footprint. Um, certainly the systems, which I think both ourselves and um, HIROC do, uh, take up just a few car park spaces in terms of actual size of systems, so they're small. Um, effectively, how it works is we take 
methane, which is, of course, the core uh, constituent of uh, natural gas and biogas. We apply a little bit of energy to it and we split it into hydrogen and carbon. Now, the carbon doesn't come out as CO2. It comes out as solid carbon black, which effectively we capture, put it in a, a drum and take away. And that can then be sold as a second revenue stream and therefore reducing the cost of the hydrogen to the trust. So it has a significantly low cost uh, because of those two revenue inputs. Also, it can be done quickly. It doesn't require a lot of infrastructure. Uh, you may or may not be aware that there's a lot of gas pipes around the country. It's about 283,000 kilometres of pipe. Uh, and that's what we're really exploiting. You ha all have gas pipes right to your sites. We'll take that gas and decarbonise it. And that's the key thing. The carbon black is uh, a, a very viable product. It can be used in production of tyres, batteries, inks, and many other applications. So it's, it's, it's got lots of opportunities. Next slide, please. What the system will effectively look like is it will be a, a system which takes at one end, if we call it that, uh, natural gas or biogas. Electricity goes in there too, and the outputs are hydrogen and green carbon black. We use, Suizo uses a microwave pyrolysis pr process, but there are other processes all have um, uh, relative advantages and disadvantages in certain applications. The, the on-site methane pyrolysis generators can produce typically up to about a, a tonne of hydrogen a day, which is a significant amount. Uh, we've certainly been looking at applications uh, throughout the UK and, and not just in uh, Trossful Trusts. And in fact, what we can see is that uh, and when we've looked at the data, it has significantly lower carbon emissions than grid powered electrolysis. So it's possibly the best way to decarbonize your systems. Uh, we can also use biogas if that's available. Um, but we'd think most in most cases for most uh, applications within the NHS, we'll be using natural gas and decarbonizing it on site. Next slide, please. For our solution as a microwave generation solution, effectively, again, looking at the same sort of system, we'd have a shipping container size box. Um, we would be looking at uh, adding a little compressor after that to get to the storage pressure. Uh, we'd put a reservoir, um, storage reservoir um, after that, and that would go straight into a boiler system. In this particular one we just set out here, we'd be producing 250 kilos of hydrogen a day. Uh, the output of carbon output at that point would be um, 750 kilos and to the extent that other uh, hydrogen is required or there's any interruption, any disaster, we can ensure consistency of delivery by having auxiliary hydrogen available, which can be put stored in the storage reservoir. Uh, we will start by uh, shipping systems about 120 to 250 kilos of hydrogen a day, but we'll soon be up to a, th um, a ton a day of hydrogen and you can see the relative power outputings there. Uh, we use, uh, and most of the uh, methane pyrolysis companies will use low medium pressure gas, so just straight out the pipe. We don't need to be connected to main pressure and standard three phase electricity. So it's these are all readily available on site. Uh, we would offer to operate and maintain the system and of course deal with all the output carbon black. Next slide, please. Uh, lots of stuff on the slide, conscious of time, effectively what we're doing here is just comparing the three main methods of hydrogen production to methane pyrolysis. I've been slightly cheeky and put Suizo as the methane pyrolysis solution there, but effectively it's the same for all of us. We have massively reductions in CO2 emissions compared to SMR. We have 80, we use 80% 80 less uh, uh, electrical energy than electrolysis, which is a huge gain. Uh, because we're producing the hydrogen on site, there's no hydrogen deliver, uh, delivery cost, which makes a huge difference to what the trust actually pays. And there are a number of indirect carbon savings, which I'll go into in a bit more detail um, soon, which actually makes us a negative emitter.
So we, we actually reduce emissions in other places. Next slide, please. Key thing here is, of course, um, is it the greenest? Because everyone talks about green hydrogen. So methane pyrolysis is right now the greenest hydrogen, without question. We have um, uh, done some work for Bayes uh, back in 22, using their figures, not ours, uh, with direct comparison with grid powered electrolysis. And you can see from the chart there, we've got a massively less carbon footprint than electrolysis, but a, a less than a third of it. Uh, and that's not including our, the offset from our indirect carbon savings, which we take as, as I say, down to negative. Bayes also asked us to look at what would happen in, say, 10, um, well, 12, 12 years time and 25, uh, 35, where the, obviously we'll have much more renewables powering the grid. And even then, we're only slightly uh, higher than uh, electrolysis. But again, with our indirect footprint, we're massively lower. So it is the greenest hydrogen. So uh, electrolysis is not the greenest solution and will not be in the future. Next slide, please. To give you a rough idea about the core economics of it, again, this is using fig uh, figures from Bayes, uh, and we looked at producing a, a kilo of hydrogen. And uh, natural gas costs are using 2021 prices would be uh, £1.50 for a kilo for us. We'd use about 60 p's worth of electricity and some other, obviously, depreciation, et cetera, uh, costs within there would get us to about £4.20 for that kilo of hydrogen. However, we also produce three kilos of carbon black at that point, and that gets us a net to less than £1.50 uh, uh, for uh, per kilo of hydrogen. Using the same figures for uh, electrolysis, it's six pounds per kilo of hydrogen. And, th and this is before we, in uh, we include any distribution costs. So there's a significant gain for methane pyrolysis on this. Next slide, please. The indirect savings won't necessarily be immediately important to you, but they are important to the environment. So uh, all methane pyrolysis um, systems effectively produce emission-free carbon black. This compares very favorably to the current ways of making carbon black, which is basically taking um, uh, heavy oils and coal tars and a few other residuals of the refining process and, and burning them, which produces about 3.3 uh, kilos of CO2 for every kilo of carbon black. We produce none. So effectively, what it means is, is that for every kilo of hydrogen we produce, we reduce CO2 emissions in traditional carbon black processes by 10 kilos, and that's very significant. Next slide, please. Ah, and over to my friends at IROC. Fantastic, thank you, Stuart. Um, my name is Sandy Abathnot. I'm uh, I'm here from uh, from Hyrock. Uh and uh, I'm Stuart has done a fantastic job at, at explaining the benefits of, of converting uh, hydrocarbons from any source, biomethane, natural gas, etc., um, to, to hydrogen and carbon black. Um, we our, our process is, is is the chemistry is absolutely identical. Um, the physics is, is a little bit different, but but all the kind of the um, the the main kind of points that that Stuart kind of spelled out um, apply to us as well. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so I, I'm not going to. Um, uh, dwell on kind of uh, on 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 um, the company. Kind of, we want to make it much more kind of focus on applications. But just to introduce Hyrock, um, our technology is around um, thermal plasma electrolysis. So as I said, the chemistry is identical. The physics from uh, methane pyrolysis is a bit different. We we kind of disassociate the the hydrocarbon in a very strong electric field, which creates a thermal plasma. Um, but but the end result is exactly the same. Um, we found it about uh, four years ago. You can see some of our investors on the right hand side. Um, next slide, please. Um, we, I, I mean, if you've got a box, as, as Stuart um, represented, you've got a box that takes in hydrocarbons and electricity, much less power than, say, water electrolysis, and it outputs um, clean emissions-free hydrogen and carbon black. You can do a lot with it. There are lots of um, there are lots of applications through to decarbonizing the existing fossil fuel-based economy, taking the emissions out of things like flare gas and uh, industrial waste gases, through to um, providing the basis of that distributed production and enabling the hydrogen economy, 
And then, um, you know, as, as again, as Stuart mentioned, if you're using biogenic carbon, biogenic feedstock in, in both of our processes, and you're sequestering that solid carbon um, in a product or in or underground, effectively, you've got a carbon removal from the atmosphere, you're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So um, that, that, again, is helping um, but generating hydrogen at the same time as, as supporting kind of net zero goals by removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, we're here to talk specifically about decarbonizing industry and, and heat and, uh, and specifically um, heating. So let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, next slide, please, Clive. Um, Centrica is one of our investors. Um, Oli, I think, is going to be talking about these two elements a little bit later. So I will skip over them and <laughs> go on to the next slide. Um, so where are we at the moment in terms of technology development? Uh, I mentioned we were founded back in 2019 uh, and the core technology was was proved with with an independent um, certification by SGS back back in back in 2019. Um, the focus for the last three or four years has been on that technology. So we demonstrated our, our technology in a product at our um, at our engineering facility in Hull last year. Um, and we have uh, we have pilots live this year. So you can see the image there is uh, is the, the two units we have um, on site at uh, the Centrica gas peaking station in North Lincolnshire at Brig. Um, and, and the aim here is this year really is to take the box and show by, by um, a mix of, of physical pilots and concept and feasibility studies, what you can do with it. What, how versatile is, is that box? Um, what are the use cases? Where does it work best? Where is it optimized for? Um, and, uh, and, and where do the, where do the techno, techno economics stack up best? Uh, and then looking ahead to 2024 and beyond, uh, we are, we're planning to, to roll out commercially, so commercial standardized mass produced units, um, uh, confirm the viability in, in, in other applications and further applications and be ready to, to roll out. And, and again, the, the beauty of, of our systems as well, just in common with Suiso, is it's, um, they're modular, they're scalable, we mass produce them, um, the, 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 the unit economics can only get better as we get down the experience curve and, and we produce these, uh, these units at volume at scale. On to the next slide, please. Um, so if we are deploying some of these units on an NHS uh, site, a, a few things to think about. Um, clearly, the reason we would do this, the reason we're all on this call is, is to take the carbon out of the system. You know, we don't, that, that, that atmospheric CO2, um, we, we, need to, we need to reduce, we need to, uh, to take out from the system. So by taking out the, the carbon, um, shipping it away in trucks, putting into a useful product. We're leaving the good bit. We're leaving the hydrogen. We're still enabled to, enabling to um, to use the existing gas grid, the existing um, electricity connection. So clearly, there are going to be impacts across scope one and scope two and scope three, which we'd need to consider. Um, the economics. There is a possible support that the government clearly is is pushing is hydrogen is pushing hydrogen. Hydrogen is a key lever in in the UK's net zero ambitions. Um, there are lots of schemes emerging. There's the hydrogen business model, which we'll talk about in a second. The ITF, which is the Industrial Energy Tran Transformation Fund. Um, other, other kind of government schemes to help bridge the gap, um, uh, bridge the kind of technology risk and the financial kind of risk um, so that we can deploy these technologies at the scale that we need. Um, Footprint for clearly for the for the unit itself, they are very small, but but we have kind of carbon that comes out of the, the process, which we need to think about getting off site in a uh, in as easy as way as possible. Evidently, um, anyone, no one on this call can accept any disruption to hospital operations. You know, we we all we all know and need hospitals. We we need to make sure that they um, that there is that there is kind of heating provided throughout. And actually, the beauty of this technology is effectively you're replacing um, the the kind of the core technology, but actually all the infrastructure remains exactly the same. Um, I talked about vehicle movements, um, power and gas, uh, and uh, and local supply. Um, compared to, to grid powered water electrolysis, as, as Stuart says, you know, the, the, this takes you're releasing because you're releasing energy that's inherited in the hydrocarbon rather than ripping apart water. Um, you need so much less energy than you would if you were creating hydrogen on site um, through other means. Um, evidently, there's 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 a lot around um, permits and, and HSE to make sure that uh, environmental and, and HSE impacts are, um, are, are acknowledged and, and understood and, and accounted for. 
Um, and and as we've we've all been saying, you know, the 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 efficiency inherent in using existing infrastructure, existing gas network, electricity grids, and uh, and indeed the the infrastructure within the building, all it is is a slot in unit to take the carbon out before it gets to to where it gets burnt. You know, there there is um, uh, it, it's inherently efficient. Um, again, in contrast to 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 other ways of decarbonizing the same thing. Um, I do have one a, a very brief slide. There's a lot. Next slide, please. Sorry, there's a um, there's a lot of detail on here around the, the hydrogen business model. Um, that the HBM has been focused uh, primarily on the, the the two mechanisms of making hydrogen that that most people have heard of. So steam methane reforming and water electrolysis. Um, there is going to be a, a, a release of the low carbon hydrogen standard in the next few weeks, we hope, uh, which would which acknowledge that the fact that actually turning hydrocarbons into uh, to uh, hydrogen and carbon black through pyrolysis or, or thermal plasma electrolysis um, is low carbon. It counts as low carbon. It's valid. Um, and, uh, and and therefore would qualify for the hydrogen business model. And, and that that is the hydrogen business model is there in order to bridge the gap to enable the rollout of all this this technology at scale um, without that support to to make the economics add up on both the supply and the demand side. We're not going to get there and the government appreciate that. And I think they're working as fast as they can to uh, to make that work. And the way it will work is through a, a contracts for difference. So similar to um, to the government incentives around renewables. Um, final slide. Um, so we just as an illustration, um, it could be any hospital, but just a, as an illustration about one one of our um, four torch high comm units um, that that has capacity to produce 126 tons of, of low emissions hydrogen a year, which is just over four gigawatt hours um, would avoid 1500 tons of CO2 from en entering the atmosphere. Um, it would generate 400 tonnes of, of, of carbon black, which would displace 800 or even more tonnes of scope three emissions from that existing production. Um, as we said, it utilises the existing gas and electricity grid, requires a fraction of the electricity of water electrolysis and is not very big. So um, that's the kind of the final illustration and the final point that I wanted to make. Thank you very much for your time and, and again, happy to answer any questions that, might, that people might have. Thank you, Sandy. Um, just carrying on, really, uh, just acknowledging the fact that Centrica is working very closely with High Rock, um, and we re really see an opportunity with uh, High Rock units coupled directly with hydrogen ready uh, CHPs. Um, so a number of these trusts have already got um, CHP units in use, typically running you know, directly from grid on methane, and really wanted to promote some understanding about the ability to 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 either deliver or convert. Um, CHPs into being a, a hydrogen fueled uh, unit, either completely or as a, a blending mechanism. Uh, so we really see um, the the the, uh, the the high rock processes as an ability to use uh, green uh, electricity from the grid, either um, surplus uh, solar, for example, or, or at lower cost grid times, um, to decarbonize the the methane into hydrogen and carbon black. Uh, which can be stored on site and then used directly in either hydrogen boilers or CHPs. And there's a there's small infographic at the bottom just to explain how that works. Uh, Clive, if we could just move on a slide, please. Um, so the, the hydrogen ready CHPs or really methane ready CHPs, if you want to uh, talk in, in a future tense. So um, we've now got technology that can run 100, on 100% hydrogen or blended solutions up to that. Uh, so with the use of a dual gas train, um, it's now possible to have a CHP that can run on 100% methane in, in current state. Uh, it can run on a blend. So as the grid starts to decarbonise and we saw, see more blending in the grid, then the, the CHP can deal with that. Or in fact, we can do direct blending at site. So with, with the likes of a high rock unit, you could take methane from the grid and, and any um, hydrogen that you're able to produce locally on site can be blended directly by the uh, by the CHP itself up to a up to a mixture of 50% by volume um, and then of course we're capable of running 100% hydrogen at such a point that, that feedstock is available um, so when we're talking about these assets and the the value that these assets can still bring in terms of operating costs um, we're very much um, cognizant of concerns related to stranded assets and you know what's the future for these assets as, as the grid moves away from methane and as, as hydrogen becomes more readily available. Um, uh, the, the message here is that, that that is possible, 
Um, and these units are already capable uh, of doing that. And, and we have uh, demonstration sites where, where we're in fact already doing that. Clive, if you could just move forward. So just finally, um, in terms of Centrica's commitment and investment with uh, with High Rock into proving the concept. Um, so the photo you see on the right hand side here is a is a peaking power plant that, that Centrica owned over near Brig. Um, and this site is, a, is we're proud to say is one of the pilot sites for the um, for the High Rock products. Um, so we've got a, a High Rock facility actually running there now, uh, which is in a trial stage. Um, and the ultimate plan is that the uh, the hydrogen is produced by that facility um, will be fed directly and blended into those existing assets that uh, that are currently uh, creating electricity under peak demand times for the grid. So really trying to demonstrate you know, that not only is this theoretically possible, but we're actually doing it. We're actually investing in making this happen. Um, and that reference site will be available for people to see to to understand how it works and to hopefully pr promote some more confidence um, that this is a you know a plausible way forward. Okay, thank you, Clive. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, unlike the other speakers on the call today, I uh, don't think there's much point looking at the technology of solar, and we're more looking at a case study of a project that's just coming to completion. Uh, obviously, an installation of a solar farm here was uh, seven megawatts for the Royal Wolverhampton Trust at New Cross Hospital. Um, the benefits of this are obvious in terms of um, uh, delivering electricity and avoiding carbon. But a lot of the hospital sites would have the challenge of finding the space to install that. Uh, so here we've got a, a 40 acre site which was a, a, a council-owned site, which had been landfill uh, in a former coal mine. Uh, so it was a collaboration between the hospital and the local authority to develop that as a solar farm. This has been developed as part of a, a larger decarbonisation project, where the solar farm is connected by a, a private wire to the hospital, uh, and in association with the heat pumps, it is a good source of green energy decarbonising the hospital. Can we go on to the next slide, please, Clive? Uh, so this was a, a launch with Thalix. who would come to the site for an inspection just at the start of the installation. And we're going to be reducing the carbon footprint by 1,500 tonnes a year. Uh, and this is going to be almost a 20-year uh, project uh, where, where we'll be de uh, monitoring and delivering on the solar farm the, there's a guarantee there as well and it will be delivering the electricity for the site for about three quarters of the year so it obviously is a significant part of delivery you can go on to the next slide please this is really looking at some of the challenges um obviously building on a, a landfill site uh, had significant issues so this is part, partly with the local authority and the environment agency, making sure that there was a gas monitoring and ventilation system in place. Uh, during construction, this had to be monitored in terms of the actual, all the, the location of the gas pipes, but also monitoring whatever emissions were going on for the safety of the personnel on site, which is an ongoing issue, obviously. Um, and there was also various drainage uh, Im implemented uh, to make sure that any runoff wasn't going to be polluting local areas. This has been mo monitored by Environment Agency throughout. Uh, construction works are almost complete there, uh, just waiting for final connections and DNO upgrades. There was environmental issues on the site as well because we found some badger sets. So the, the, the site had to be changed and protective fences put in place. Uh, pleased to say it looks like those, the badges are still in place, haven't been affected, uh, despite the amount of piling and construction work that went on over a few months. Private wire was uh, quite a challenge as well, um, going through the local site, but we ended up going through one of the main roads across a bridge and starting affecting uh, the routes into the hospital. All this was managed with the hospital uh, and other roadworks that were going on at the same time. Um, th this is looking like it's going to be an excellent project. It's the, the biggest 
uh, solar farm connected to a hospital in the UK at the moment uh, and, and hope that many other hospitals can deliver similar. And that, that's all for there, Clive. Thank you. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Clive. Um, yeah, we should give the full credit to the CF team to perfectly organize in the slides. It's a, it's a perfect flow, actually. Um, yeah, so so picking up from from the from the previous uh, discussion, um, here we are talking about an alternative way of purchasing your electricity. If you jump to the next next slide, Clive. I mean, as as NHS trust, you all family with long term contracts. So you had your EP, uh, your energy performance contracts on long term contracts, and your district heating is on long term contracts. And then similar to that, if you haven't gone into buying your electricity on on long term contracts, and that's a very good way of getting significant savings from there. So how do how do we do electricity contracts through a long term contract? So those on those ones are through power purchase agreements. Some of you might have done power purchase agreements already, and then some of you might not have uh, done it. Um, but essentially, where it sits on the merit order as such. So when you get your renewable, when you get your electricity on site, so the cheapest and the most greenest way of doing that is your on site generation. And then the next stage is that after you do your on site generation, as in the previous presentation, we have seen the if we can do a private wire, getting getting renewable energy from a solar farm or a, another renewable project through a private wire is the, is the next cheapest and then the uh, greenest way because because you avoid your transmission and distribution charges and you today's as well because yeah so 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 the so the second be best uh, way to green your electricity is through off-site um, private wire agreements so in, so in there, you avoid your transmission and distribution charges, but also at, at the same time, it's a, it's 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 absolute green energy. So the one we are talking here is is for offsite renewable energy, and and on the on the previous presentation we have talk, spoke about how we decarbonize the heat, but then after you decarbonize the heat, you still have your electric demand to meet. And then you might not have enough land available near your site to do the solar farms or the renewable generation. And that's where the, the offsite PPA comes in. So the PPA is in power purchase agreement. Um, yeah, um, if you jump into the next slide, Clive. Yeah, so in, so in there, what, what we do is that, like what, what we have to do is that essentially you need to look at your, your demand profile. So after you do, you do your all your energy efficiency measures, and your CHPs and your and your other other hydrogen production methods, etc. You you see your residual electricity demand, and then we need to see what are the best renewable sources that can match your um, electricity demand. And then you, as a trust, you agree into a direct agreement with that renewable generator to purchase that electricity. And then when you get that electricity, obviously that electricity comes through your normal grid, and um, so it won't be a private wire to you. And when you get that electricity, there'll be green certificates, the green credentials, regos come with that as well. So true in that approach, you can't avoid your transmission and distribution charges. It'll be still there. But from a from an electricity wholesale market price point of view, you can get a significantly lower price in there. So the so the mechanism is the same like your EPC contracts or your district heating schemes. It's a long-term contracts. So the, through the long-term contracts, you give the financial reassurance for the renewable generator, and in return, you get a lower price from that one. And then, and then how we, um, if you if, if you jump to the next slide, Clive, yeah. So, so then, so 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 not just that you like you need to purchase renewable energy, but then, but then once you use renewable energy, you need to have more more insights on your renewable energy, how you how you use that as well. Um, and because because it's exactly like on a uh, energy performance contract, we need to have the right monitoring and verification in place because otherwise we can't guarantee or we can see how much how much it's been it's been used. And sp especially for the for the trust, it's a very good opportunity because some trust would have excess generation and then some trust would 
would would not have um, enough land, enough generation, uh, enough enough generation capacity. So similar to what you are buying from a renewable source, one trust can agree a contract with another trust to get their excess renewable energy across to across to your side. By by doing that, you're you're simply working between the trust to provide that renewable energy and 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 that's what we can provide as a as an organization as well so the so the, the current electricity regulation completely allows that that arrangement um, and then, and we will do those things through a prior to our agreement um we can jump to the next slide Clive I think I think we can actually uh, skip that one because I'm I'm conscious on time as well yeah um yeah, so they kind of like when you when you buy renewable energy from a source, um, this is the process um, that will go. Um, so essentially, like one trust would list their renewable source on on like can can list on the platform, and then and then afterwards the other other trust can enter their details and then see how much how much energy that they can get from there, how much it's going to cost um, cost and so on. Yeah, um, if you can jump to the next slide, Clive. Maybe you have to, yeah. Uh, yeah, so in, in very much similar to your standard energy performance contracts. Um, it's it we we believe it's really important to have the full monitoring and verification. Yeah, and with that we can go to the next presenter. Okay, um, Invidity, uh, one of the manufacturers of flow batteries. So we've installed a lot of lithium ion battery, batteries recently, and they've been in the news, and they're in a lot of people's cars and all the rest of it. Um, but they, we all know the, the disadvantages of lithium batteries. So if you've got electricity and you need to store it, how do you store it? Lithium batteries are one way method, but a megawatt hour of, of lithium batteries is expensive and quite a big thing. And it's got 500 to 1,000 cycles and it's uh, got a certain fire risk and all the rest of it. Are there alternatives? Well, there are things called flow batteries used by the industry, the actually industry particularly, Here's an, uh, a set of flow batteries. These could be installed on your site or remotely, you know, and be part of the whole shipping electricity around. And the nice thing about them is the uh, they've got, if you look at the graph at the bottom here, you can see the lifespan, the black little black curve of a lithium battery, and then the lifespan of a of a uh, a uh, flow battery. So the idea is there are alternatives to lithium. Uh, that can uh, be much higher capacity um, and have other advantages, particularly lifespan, and could be used part of an electricity strategy um, where you're forced to use large quantities or store large quantities of electricity. Um, and here has a whole pile of information about them. I've just taken these off, off of the data sheet for, for them. So this is live stuff you can buy. The uh, UK grid already has um, many tens of, of flow batteries, mostly used by the utility. And the question is, have they got a place for us in the NHS to deal with um, the cost of electricity and storage of it? OK, so uh, we're, we're, we're running quite tight on time, so I've rattled through the flow battery. I'm going to try and get a flow battery speaker to actually speak to us at the next session. So if you're interested in flow batteries, so watch this space. So this set of slides has been particularly aimed at trusts with no direct route to net zero. Obviously, if you can go hydrogen through a pipe, geothermal, or you've got a clean D scheme, you can join those are good things to do. If it's not an option, we have the heat pumps and their issues, and we can deal with those. And heat pumps, so we've got a lot of them now, and uh, they work fine, but in winter, you're talking about a very low COP. So you need to get your usage down you, you probably need to de-steam. You need to be considering uh, whether new buildings can operate off 40 degree water rather than 80 degree water. And you need to deal with the high electricity costs, which some of our speakers have covered for us now. OK, and then just kind of a reminder that, that if we're going to hit 2032, um, these, a lot of these tasks take a long time. So um, if you've got to do a site conversion task and, and, uh, and reduce energy, you know, in the way I've just described, you 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 you're into a three-year project and probably a Salix application or some other like. If you've actually got V-Steam, it's probably a four-year project. Well, there's roughly eight years between now and 2032. 
if you asked um, uh, for a solar farm on site or off site, you're probably talking a two year project and batteries by the time you've gone through the formalities and the DNO connections and all the rest of it, something similar. And if there, there are a lot of trusts with no direct route to net zero, and we can't do you all at once. So we, and we've all got our own approval routes and our own particular issues to deal with. Um, so the, this is something needs to start, which is why we're doing it now and why we'll invite you to the workshops at IE. Okay, uh, you've probably all seen this before. The NH Power is a collaboration. We're there to help, but we're all volunteers. Nobody's being paid to do that. And to the extent we get feedback from you and you rely on the services, we'll attempt to keep providing them. After IHEM, when you should leave IHEM knowing which is the best route for you and roughly how long, when you need to start and when you need to finish, you'll be offered a chance to a roadshow in November, December, and hopefully at that you'll emerge with an idea of the cost and savings for your project and enough information then to write your, your uh, carbon plan. And then if we're all still alive and interested, then NH Power will swap to trying to implement. So I'm talking to procurement people about procuring uh, these various services in a way that it makes it easy for trusts to, uh, to uh, start using them and putting them in their plan. Okay, you've probably seen these, the August and September talks which is the, the, the middle column there, just about done. The talks get repeated in September, and then we have the IEM workshops in, uh, in October at IEM, where we can meet the people you've seen today and many others face-to-face -face and talk to them and see their stuff and get them to explain much more about what's going on. The 11th is Hydrogen Day. Uh, that said, um, the hydrogen people you've seen today are on, actually on the 10th. So if you're interested in today's hydrogen technology, you need to be there on the 10th. If you're interested in hydrogen in general, well, bad luck, you'll have to be there the 10th and the 11th. And uh, if you're just interested in part hydrogen, you probably attended a different talk, and uh, that's the 11th. Um, okay, everybody else who's on this call today will be there on the 10th. Okay, and I've already said this, that you uh, we, we want you to know what the path is at the end of Ahim. And we want to, in the roadshow, give you an idea of the costs and the savings. Now, I've galloped through that bit. It is quarter past. I did book you to 20 past. The questions have been coming, and hopefully people have been typing in answers to them. Uh, I'd like to, um, does anybody want, got um, a question that they've seen that they'd like to answer in public uh, in front of everybody, rather than just rely on the chat? Um, I haven't been able to keep monitoring the chat myself. So, uh, anybody see something they want to explain further? No. Okay. Nice. I would well, possibly go go for it. Hi. I was just going to call it. There was one that generated quite a lot of likes um, from Alexis. Um, so asking, can we address the elephant in the room, please? Methane is still a fossil fuel, and if from the fossil industry, it is an element of greenwashing. This is a form of brown hydrogen here. How do you anticipate getting around this with a reduction of methane availability in the longer term? Hi, I'm, Sandy. I'm, I'm, take, I'm happy to, to have a perspective on that. Um, Thank you. I mean, yes, of, of course, it's a question that we get a lot. Um, I think from our perspective, fossil fuels are unfortunately fantastic fuels. You know, they're energy dense, they're easy to transport. That's the reason that our economy has, has been based on them for the last 150 years. Um, and we have to start from where we are rather than where we'd like to be. Um, so I think we'd all like to get to a point where uh, there are no fossil fuels, but but we're not going to get there overnight. And and actually, when you look at it in kind of in, in, in the cold light of day, it's the emissions that are the issue rather than the extraction per se. Um, and frankly, to keep aligned with that one and a half degree trajectory, we need to be able to we need to have cut our emissions in half as a world in, by the end of the decade, which is a monumental task. So actually being able to start decarbonizing the existing network, taking the carbon out of what we've already got and, and sequestering it, it's not entering the atmosphere, it's in solid carbon black, it's not going anywhere, it's not contributing to golden war global warming. That is, I think, one of the only ways we're going to we're going to bridge that gap before the investment and the new technologies that are that are kind of truly not based on fossil fuels come online. Um, and and the other thing I'd say is that you know, beyond fossil fuels, when as and when we we move away from um, from methane as a as a as a form of energy, um, I think Stuart already mentioned in 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 one of the comments. Um, 
there's a lot of there's an awful lot of biogenic um, biomethane CO2 um, that, that is a, that are we're using something like five percent of the possible biomass uh, as an energy source. So there's a huge amount there of, of of biogenic and atmospheric CO2 that we can remove and sequester as part of this. Um, uh, using this technology, so I think it's a, it's not absent. There's no silver bullet. There's no panacea, but but actually, technologies like methane pyrolysis and and TPE have to be part of the equation um, because we are where we are. Yeah, I mean, just just to add to that, because it's it, it isn't just the elephant in the room. It's the wheel that's wagging its tail every time I go to one of these conversations. <clears throat> the reality is, it's a very positive uh, environmental uh, message we have for you all. We are decarbonizing, we're taking all of the carbon out of the gas that you're currently using, all of it. We're capturing it and we're redeploying it in a solid form. It's not CO2 which is being buried and we're hoping for the best. It's not CO2 being sold to a drinks company to put in your Coca-Cola or your beer. Uh, this is it, it's going into gaskets and hoses and tires and inks and all the way through. This is as good as it gets, it really does do well. And even if we default to in a long term, the future to biomethane, the fact is the biomethane production is a highly emissive process. It really does produce a lot of um, CO2. So what we do is we take a lot of that CO2 out of that process. Uh, and I think that can only be regarded as a really, really good thing. Uh, so I, I'm happy to debate this with anyone face to face at the workshops. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, both Sandy and I will persuade you that it, this isn't just a, 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 a greenwashing. God, I hate the word. Uh, this really is a super positive thing to do. It's got a great message, and we're decarbonizing the production of carbon black. So uh, it's this is a negative uh, emitter. We're actually taking CO2 production out of existing methods. So it, it can only be looked at as a very good thing. Okay, very, very solidly answered. Thank you very much. Lorna, anything else that struck me that we need to cover or are we going to let everybody grab a couple of minutes? Yeah, that, that was the, the biggest okay. one I thought would be worth addressing to the audience. That's all. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I might, we, the next session is booked in also for 50 minutes. Um, well, we've kind of managed, so let's that, 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 that stick with that for next time. But we, we are considering whether we want to bring any of these technologies back for a slightly longer session in, in a sort of an off the off the piste talk. If any of you would like us to bring back any or all of these speakers on, on a separate call, just let us know and we'll see whether it's possible to work it into the scheme of things. Otherwise, um, you'll see them face to face. They will be talking to the Energy Theatre at IHEM. You'll see them at the workshops. You better talk to them afterwards. You better ask them anything you like. And uh, you should be able to find out and kick the tires thoroughly on this technology. So I'm going to thank the speakers and lots of you and you only had a few minutes to say your piece. So thank you very much for saying that. And uh, thank you everybody for attending in, in Mary's stead. And the next week we start the September round, move to Wednesdays because in case some people don't work Thursdays. And we will repeat the session because we know an awful lot of people are on leave. So we repeat these talks again, but they will go up on the web and you'll shortly be able to find this video there. But somehow people prefer it live to record it, but it will be there and recorded. So I'm going to turn the recording off and uh, and thank you all for attending. Um, if that's OK, if you've got a last question, you better have typed it very quickly. Otherwise, uh, email it in and we'll do what we can do with it afterwards. Thank you all very much. <laughs>